Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I trust you are doing well and that you are ready to worship the Lord together. Uh, I know uh, you are used to seeing Pastor Jack uh, on these videos for Sunday morning. This past week he's been on some uh, time off, vacation. Uh, so I'm with you this morning and I look forward to sharing with you from Luke chapter 14. So if you've got your Bibles, if you will, turn to Luke 14. We're going to be in verses 25 through 33. And I've titled this morning's message as a question, Who can be His disciple? Who can be His disciple? On July the 6th, 1916, Leslie's Weekly Magazine published their magazine with the title, What Are You Doing for Preparedness? On the cover of this specific magazine was the famous I Want You sign. You know, the, the one where Uncle Sam is pointing his bony finger in your face saying, I want you. Later, this image would be adapted by the U.S. Army, and they would use it for recruiting purposes for the war, World War One, And four million copies would be printed from 1917 through 1918. I want you. The U.S. Army here gave an invitation wanting you, wanting others to come help serve alongside others. They gave this great invitation for help. Today in our text, Jesus is giving an invitation, not wanting help, but desiring you to come to Him. In our text, Jesus is inviting sinners to completely surrender and fully follow after Him. See, a genuine disciple of Christ surrenders all to Christ and follows after Christ. There are some who call themselves Christians, who claim they are saved, yet they never really follow Jesus. Today, our text shows us that a claim of salvation without evidence of that salvation that is, following after the one who has saved us, or saved you, is false. It's not real. It's not genuine. Today in our text, Jesus pulls no punches. He is very straightforward. He is clear about who can be His disciple and who cannot. There is no false narrative here. There is no fake news. If Jesus was publishing a paper... He would label such claims, those who claim to be a Christian and don't follow Him, He would claim, He would label those as false news, fake news. A reputable social media giant would censor your account or deem your post as not being able to be fact-checked if indeed you claim to be a Christian and never followed after Christ. What evidence is there of your salvation? If you, are, you or I are unwilling to follow after Jesus, then have we been saved at all? Well, surely not. If you and I are unwilling to follow after Jesus, then we will see this declarative statement three times in this passage. We cannot be His disciple. Let me be clear. Jesus is saying that. If you were unwilling to surrender your life and follow Jesus... You can not be His disciple. See, genuine discipleship requires that one must come to Jesus, one must surrender to Jesus, and one must follow after Jesus. A continual, just not a one-time following, just not a, a, at the moment at the altar call. No, it is a continual day-by-day, -day, life laying down, following of Jesus Christ. See, I want us to note here, before we even get into the text, salvation is indeed something we do not work for. Salvation is a free gift from God to repentant sinners. But you must come how God has specified. You must come the way God has determined. And that is through Jesus. That is through you humbly owning yourself a sinner, repenting of your sins and turning to Jesus in faith and following after Him. Let's read the text. 
Luke 14, verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If, here's that condition, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate, uh, deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So that leaves us with the question, who can be his disciple? Those who come... Christ we're going to see. If you desire this morning to follow Christ, you must, number one, I'm going to give you four truths this morning. If you desire to follow Christ, I'm going to give you four truths. Number one, come to Christ. We see that in verse 26 that we've read. He says, if anyone comes to me, Jesus is given an invitation. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus gives invitations to those that are heavy and, 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 and downtrodden to come to Him and He will give rest. Throughout the Scriptures, He's calling people to come to Him for salvation. And that come here, it implies coming to Jesus, seeking salvation, making a decision to follow Jesus. Right now, this morning, come to Jesus. Verse 25, we would see that the crowds are following Him, and Jesus turned to the crowd. He turned to those who were coming after Him. Jesus, right now, this morning, will turn to you. If you will come to Him, Jesus turns to you. Jesus wants sinners to come to you. He invites sinners to come to Him. So who can be His disciple? Those who first and foremost come to Jesus. Now, how is that? How do they come? Well, first you've got to come in repentance. It doesn't specifically say that in this passage, but throughout Scripture, Jesus would tell us that you must humbly repent of your sins. You must own yourself a sinner. And you must repent. You must turn from your sins. And in that turning from your sins, you must turn to Jesus Christ in faith to save you from your sins. Repentance and faith. You don't come on your own terms. You don't come in your own power. You humbly come, bowing the knee, acknowledging that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Savior of the world. And He died for you on the cross in your place. His atoning sacrifice paid for your sins and satisfied the righteous, holy wrath of God. Jesus died for you. And when you come to Jesus, you must come in repentance and faith. Who can be His disciple? Those who come to Jesus in repentance and faith. The second truth I would give you from this text this morning about if you desire to follow Christ, you must, number two, surrender to Christ. We see that in verses 26, really the entire passage, 26 and 27. We see that you need a complete surrender, not a partial. A partial surrender is no surrender at all. You need a complete surrender to Christ. First, we see you must surrender past priorities. He talks about that. He, he mentions the families. Your loyalty. That doesn't mean you've got to be not loyal to your family. That doesn't mean you've got to abandon your family. We care for our families. But our allegiance is... Our ultimate allegiance is to be with Jesus Christ. We have to surrender past priorities. Maybe your past priority was a hobby that... that Sinful. Maybe it could be any sin. It could be a relationship that's not healthy. It could be any of these things. Now, if it's a relationship within the bounds of marriage, hey, you need to work at that. A family relationship, you need to work at that. I'm talking about a, 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 maybe an affair, an adulterous relationship. Get out of that. 
Look, when you surrender to Christ, you surrender your past priorities, whatever the priority may be. Maybe it was work, maybe it was wealth, maybe it was security, maybe it was retirement. All those things that, that we place before God, you surrender those things. Not only that, you must surrender present power. This is saying to Christ, I will presently and continually surrender my desires and my will and my strength to you. Use me how you see fit. Take me where you want me. Use me up however you desire to use me. We surrender our past priorities. We surrender our current power, our present power. Lord, use me now. Not only that, you must surrender future privileges. Whatever my future holds, God, is in your hands. Surrender to Christ. Those who want to follow Christ, those who want to be His disciple, must surrender to Christ. He uses in, in verse 27 where he talks about you must bear your own cross. That bearing your own cross is bearing anything that's burdensome, carrying or sustaining a burden. Now, you'll hear frequently from other Christians, we all have to bear our cross. And, and there's some truth in that. But in context, what is our Lord talking about here? What is He talking about someone who is bearing a cross? Think about in their day. Put your mind in their context. When they saw the imagery of a cross, they saw death. They saw torture. They saw death. Somebody carrying a cross was on their way to be tortured and on their way to die. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying those who surrender to Him are saying, I am willing to die for you. Or another way we could put it, I am dying to myself. I have no claim on my life any longer. See, becoming a disciple of Christ doesn't mean you get a life of ease. No, it means you get a life of dying to yourself. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's why Jesus uses this vivid imagery here. In other places in the Gospels, He would say that you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after Him. Again, He's using that instrument of death. Die to self. Us sinners, we struggle with that. But we are called in our surrender to Christ. Jesus is saying, you want to follow after me? You want to be my disciple? You want to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ? Die to yourself. Fully, completely surrender to Christ. You haven't fully surrendered to Christ until you've died to self. And that's not always easy. He also uses the word here where he talks about come. We've looked at that. If anyone comes to me, verse 27 again, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me. Come is, is literally to movement toward something. And in here, it's movement toward a person, movement toward Jesus. And I want us to notice the present tense in this. This is a conditional, uh, or, or excuse me, a continued unconditional surrender. It is continually surrendering. It, it does... <laughs> Look, we, we can struggle with this. You, just, you don't surrender just one time. We surrender daily. Oh, genuine followers of Christ. Yes, we can struggle with this. But we got to be reminded that we have to die, we have to deny ourselves daily and follow Christ. In verse 33, he uses the word, so, or the, the language there, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Renounce is literally to, to renounce something, uh, to give up something, to relinquish everything. What are we re renouncing? We are renouncing our past priorities, our, our current power, our future privileges. We're renouncing our claim to this life. And we're saying, Jesus, you've got me. Jesus, my life belongs to you. Jesus, my life is in your hands. You're the king upon the throne of my heart. You're the one calling the shots. I relinquish it to you. And that's the picture. It's continual. It's daily. You don't do it once and walk away and that's it. No, we have to daily surrender to Christ. Why does salvation require complete surrender? Why does genuine discipleship require extreme measures? It is because there is a transfer of ownership. 
a transfer of ownership. See, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. There's been a transfer of ownership. You have transferred yourself to Him. He is your owner. He is your king. He is your master. Your allegiance is no longer to self. Your allegiance is no longer to sin. Your allegiance is no longer to anyone else. It is to Jesus Christ. There's been a transfer of ownership, a transfer of allegiance. Jesus is not inviting you for a makeover. Jesus is calling you for a takeover. Hear me. We don't get an upgrade when we come to Jesus Christ. We are a new creature, Scripture would tell us. You don't get an upgrade. You get a new heart. You become a new creation. Jesus is not making you over. He's taking you over. You give Him your life. Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46, speaks of the kingdom of heaven like this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He gets rid of everything that he had. Now, I'm not telling you you got to get rid of all your possessions. Jesus isn't telling you to get rid of all your possessions. Possessions in and of themselves aren't evil. It's our motives. It's our greed behind them. They can be idolatrous, certainly, in our life. But we see here in Scripture what Jesus is telling this parable, this man, when he found salvation... He got rid of everything else. His allegiance was no longer to anything else. It was to one person. That was Jesus Christ. Who can be His disciple? Those who come to Christ and those who surrender to Christ. Yes, it's a, it's a surrender in, in repentance and faith, but it's a continual surrender day after day. The continual surrender following after Jesus day after day. Number three, who can be His disciple? Or, another way to put it, if you desire to be His disciple, you must love Christ above all else. you got to love Christ above all else. In verse 26, let me read it again. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, the Lord uses that strong word, hate, there. We're not to hate anyone. Scripture will tell us that. We're to love our our, our neighbors. We're to love and pray for our enemies. So how is our Lord using that word? Well, well here it means, hate means to to disfavor or to disregard. The Lord's using it in, in, in a sense, in a way of comparison. When others see my love for God and my allegiance to God, and they compare that to my love for my family, it would be as if I hate my family and I love God more. He's using it in a sense of comparison. We're not to hate our family. We're to love God first and foremost. Now, it can also be used to show that our priority is always God. God always wins. He's using it in that manner. When He says that you're to, you're to hate your, your, your father and your mother and your children and your brother and your wife, and, and yes, even your own life, what He means is God always wins. When the decision comes down to it, God wins. What would God say? I'm going to follow God in this. God always wins out in the life of the follower. See, when there is competing affections, God wins. When there is competing relationships, God wins. When there is competing positions, God wins. One commentator in his commentary wrote this, A person who commits himself or herself to Christ will develop a greater love for both neighbor and family. Although at times loving and following Christ may be seen as renunciation, rejection, or hate if the family does not share the same commitment to Christ. Do you see his point? As we love God properly, first and foremost, we will love others the, the second commandment, we're going to get to that in just a minute, how it will flow from the first and greatest commandment. But if you have family members that do not love Christ, that do not follow Christ, that do not like God, that curse God, it will appear as if you hate them because you love and follow God. Yet Jesus, Jesus divided quite well many, many groups. 
You, you read the Gospels and how he would preach and how he would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and there, there, there are many occasions where the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and others, they would be divided over Jesus. Unfortunately, that is still true today. There are families who are divided over Christ. And Christ is reminding those would-be followers. He's reminding you and me this morning. If you'll come after Christ, you've got to love Him first and foremost. You've got to love Him above all else. You've got to love Him so much that when people see how much you love Him, they wonder, do you love anybody else? Oh, believer, this morning, follower of Christ, I pray that we are loving Christ that way. I hinted to just a moment ago of the greatest commandment. Our Lord, again, He's not teaching us here to, to hate. We've got to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And what does He say in, in, a, in an account where there's interaction with our Lord and a scribe? And He would say this, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that He had answered them well, asked Him, so the scribe is asking Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That's what Jesus is teaching. Hey! First and foremost, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And out of that will come a love for others. But we must love God, Christ, above all else. Another commentator writes, Do not promise to follow Jesus unless you understand the cost and are willing to pay it. This does not imply that salvation must be earned. Rather, the point being made is that God's grace can only be received by those who in repenting place Him above everything else. Is Jesus Lord this morning? He is indeed Lord, but the question that we really need to ask is, is He Lord of your life? Does He reign above all else? See, Jesus does reign. But have you bowed the knee to Jesus? Is He Lord of your life? Who can be His disciple? Those who love Christ above all else. Those who are willing to leave father and mother and follow after Christ. Those who are willing to, to set aside those and surrender those past priorities, and those present powers and those future privileges and follow after Christ. Christ. So we've seen right now three truths that I've given you this morning. If you desire to follow Christ, you must come to Christ, you must surrender to Christ, you must love Christ above all else. And fourth, finally, if you desire to follow Christ, count the cost of following Christ. Count the cost. Why do I say that? Well, Verses 28 through 32, our Lord gives two different parables. And in that, He teaches us to count the cost. You know, as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I found an uh, excerpt on an expedition that I found very, very ironic. In 1845, Sir John Franklin and 138 officers set sail from England to cross the Canadian Arctic to find the Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean. Now, you're probably like me, you're thinking, ah, well, they stocked up on wool jackets and extra socks and a bunch of clothing and extra food and probably some, maybe some wood or coal or quite a bit of resources to keep them warm and comfortable and safe. Well, that's not the case. For their voyage, they took regular uniforms, dress uniforms, they took place settings for their meals, silver and china, took wine glasses. They took very little resources for their boats. They took very little coal for the two auxiliary steam engines that they had. You want to know what? 
they all died having done that. They died being ill-prepared for their voyage. Well, in these parables, verses 28 through 32, our Lord is being up front. He's not trying to say, come with me and it's going to be a life of ease. No, He's, he's letting you know up front, don't be ill-prepared. See, He gives us these two parables here. In the first one, let's read verse 28 through 30 again. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Well, what is he saying in this first parable? How, how would I sum those three verses up? I, I would say it this way. Whoever takes on a task without being ready for the total cost will make him or herself out to be a fool. That's what Jesus is saying. So here is the cost of following Jesus. So Jesus is wanting us to count the cost. His followers, His disciples, genuine followers of Christ, count the cost. They dare not do that. They must count the cost. So here it is. Here's the cost of following Jesus. It will cost you everything to follow after Jesus. Plain and simple. The first parable. Both of these, the, the, whole, the whole sum here of this text, it will cost you everything to follow after Jesus. Discipleship, that is following after Jesus, is saying goodbye to our possessions continually. It is saying yes to Jesus continually. It is saying my resources are a tool to help me follow Jesus. It is saying my belongings belong to Christ. Discipleship, that is following after Christ, is serving Christ, not serving ourselves and not serving our stuff. It doesn't mean you've got to get rid of everything you own today. It doesn't mean you need to, to own nothing and you need to become homeless. No, that's not what it means. That's not what our Lord is teaching. Our possessions need to have the proper place. We need to remember they are resources. They are tools that the Lord allows us to have to follow after Him. It will cost you everything to follow after Christ. Luke 18, verses 28 through 30 say this, And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Yes, here on earth it will cost followers of Christ everything to follow after Christ. But I'm telling you what, the eternal reward is far greater. Matthew 10, 38, Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever will follow after me in this life, Christ is saying, will find and have eternal life. It will cost you everything to follow after Christ. But not only that, what's very sobering is this. It will cost you everything to not follow after Christ. It will cost you everything to not follow after Christ. You'll see the shirts or the saying, living my best life now. I've seen it. I, you know, I've, I've heard people say it. I think our daughters have wore a shirt like that similar uh, sometimes. And I, under, I understand the gist of it. But you know, that's really not so for the Christian. Th this life can be pretty hard, can it? I mean, anyone heard of 2020? <laughs> this year's been pretty tough, hasn't it? It's been a difficult year. It, if this is the best there is, I don't know if I want to have of what's next. If this is the best, if this is my best life now, if, if, if sin is so painful as it is and, and the body just breaks down as it is and there's death and there's evil and there's wickedness and there's abandonment and there's sinful actions of man and, and all the things, the wars and, and rumors of wars and all the natural disasters. If this is the best there is, give me no more. See, the believer doesn't have to worry about that. Our, etern our real reward, our eternal reward is in heaven. But for the unbeliever, if you choose not to follow Christ, it will cost you everything. We see the second parable. Look at verse 31. 
Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. What is Jesus getting at with this portion of the parable? Well, Jesus is one of the kings. See, Jesus, the king, has won the battle. If you refuse to surrender to him and follow after him, you will plunge yourself and your army into complete destruction. You and I are the ones with 10,000 men. Jesus is the one with 20,000 men. Again, this is just an illustration, a parable. And what is the parable saying? That those who refuse to follow after Jesus, those who refuse to come to Jesus and surrender to Jesus and place Him above all else and count the cost and follow after Him, those who refuse are like that king who's going to war with just 10,000 men and he's going to go to war with the king of kings that has 20,000 men. And what's going to happen? He's going to plunge himself and his men into destruction. Complete destruction. What is Jesus saying? Look at verse 32. And if not, while the other is a great way off, He sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Jesus is, is extending peace through His death on the cross. You better come to terms with Jesus now. It's getting too late. Scripture would tell us, that we can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. See, before we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're not at peace with God. We're actually enemies of the cross. And Scripture would tell us in Romans that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Oh, this morning, this morning, Jesus is inviting you to have peace with Him. And it's not Him that needs the peace. It's us, sinners. And, and it, if you're listening this morning and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not at peace with God. You're not at peace with Christ. And you're trying to march against the King of kings who has the army of armies, and He will win. See, it will cost you everything if you don't follow after Jesus. Because you will spend your life separated apart from God. And you will spend eternity separated apart from God. Peace comes through Jesus Christ. See, to follow self might lead to a life of ease here on earth. However, it will lead to a life of eternal damnation separated from God. To follow Christ here on earth will require your denial, your self-denial. However... To follow after Christ leads to eternal salvation in the presence of God. Friend, I beg you this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not come to Christ, if you have not surrendered to Christ, if you have not uh, bowed the knee to Him, if you have not placed Him above all else in your life and, and, and surrendered to His Lordship in your life, if you have not counted the cost, I beg you this morning, count the cost this morning. Because it will cost you everything to follow Christ, but it will also cost you everything to not follow Christ. Please, please this morning, give your life to Jesus Christ. For the believer that's listening, maybe you just needed to be encouraged to continually, daily, surrender your life Surrender yourself, surrender your plans and your desires to Jesus Christ. Who can be His disciple? Those who come to Jesus, those who surrender to Jesus. In that coming, remember, there's repentance and faith. Those who surrender to Jesus, those who place Jesus above all else, and those who count the cost and follow after Jesus. Well, I pray this message has found you well. Maybe you're one of those that doesn't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Feel free to reach, reach out to us here at the church. We would love to talk with you more. 
about what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank You that You love us, even though we are really so unlovable. Lord, we thank You that You died for us, even though we didn't deserve it. We thank You that You've shown us this grace and this mercy through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank You that You have warned us in this passage this morning that casual discipleship is no discipleship at all. That followers of Jesus Christ must be wholeheartedly committed to You. They must come to You in repentance and faith. They must surrender their life to You, their will to You, their all. They must place You above all else and come after You. Father, I pray, I pray, Your people have been encouraged this morning. I pray we've been helped to follow after You. Lord, for those that don't know You as their Lord and Savior, I pray You would do what only You could do, and that is draw men to Yourself and grant salvation. Father, we thank You again for Your Word. We thank You for Your your mercy in our life. Lord, I pray now Your blessings be upon Your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a good morning, a good day. We look forward to hearing from you soon. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you'd like to connect to us, you can reach us online at tarlandingbaptist.org. There you can find helpful links such as social media, additional sermons, email addresses for pastoral staff, as well as mailing addresses and telephone numbers. Thank you for watching.